Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the survivor of the Saw chapter who just received a new tone story. Detective David Tapp. Before we get started, I'd like to talk to you about Opera GX, a browser that I was enthusiastically endorsing even before I sponsored this video. Genuinely, like sponsorship aside here, Opera GX has been my browser of choice for the past two years, so when they approached me for the sponsorship, I knew exactly what I wanted to say. If you're anything like me, you're the kind of person who likes to have lots of windows and tabs open at the same time, and running Opera GX instead of something like Chrome massively helps to improve the performance of my PC. You can use the GX control panel to limit the browser's use of your RAM, CPU, or bandwidth. But even without it, Opera GX manages to keep the browser as unobtrusive as possible, making it ideal for PCs of any performance level. Its efficiency on top of efficiency. You can also customise your visuals to suit you, with an easily accessible menu of stylish themes and colour palettes which look good and reduce screen glare, at least in my experience, at the same time. It's a win-win really. And the GX Corner is an excellent place to find new game releases, hidden free-to-play gems, or offers on titles you might have otherwise looked past. The GX Corner and many more of these fine features are also available on GX Mobile, which you can download on Android or iOS. So, what are you waiting for? Download Opera GX for free using the link in the description and upgrade your browsing experience today. Three months ago, when the Saw Tome got leaked, Tap was kind of sidelined by a lot of the Saw enthusiasts who heard about the potential for Saw stories to come. Amanda, being the much bigger and more popular character in the wider Saw storyline, was obviously the main attraction, and I'll get to her in her own video in the very near future and many people doubted that Tap would even get a story, expecting a legendary cosmetic for a character from Spiral instead, such as Chris Rock's Zeke Banks. Detective David Tap, played by the legendary Danny Glover, is a secondary character in the original Saw movie, who provides much of the wider context behind Jigsaw's philosophy and the events led up to Lawrence and Outman's bathroom game. He and his partner, the much younger detective Stephen Singh, are homicide investigators put onto the Jigsaw case by Alison Carey, who would go on to have a much bigger role in Saw 2 II and 3 as a police's resident jigsaw expert. The Tome 10 story Desecration of the Heart puts Tap centre stage as he investigates the jigsaw case on his own, presumably after the death of Stephen Singh that was depicted in Saw, and I have a lot of opinions on it. Not all good, not all bad. Because there's a lot to unpack about it, both as a story in its own right and as an expansion of David Tap's personal timeline. But in order to properly address and understand it, we need to look at Tap's canonical biography in the Saw movies. Tap, alongside Singh and Detective Mark Hoffman, who was retconned into the Jigsaw Task Force in Saw 5, were the first investigators to tackle the Jigsaw case. When Tap and Singh find the bodies of Paul Leahy and Mark Wilson, it marks Jigsaw's first run-in with the police. Right now, his motive, modus operandi, and identity as John Kramer are mysteries to both the audience and the authorities. Tap and Singh are as much strangers to John and his work as we are, and their reactions to the crime scenes and the mutilated bodies of Paul Leahy and Mark Wilson mirror our own. Brief tangent here while I go super deep into Saw canon, but it's worth noting that the continuity mangling inflicted by Saw 5 crowbarring Hoffman into the Saw narrative means there's a large period of Jigsaw activity left unaccounted for between the Tuck Barn game we see in Jigsaw and the start of Tap and Singh's investigations. Because by the time Paul Leahy and Mark Wilson are killed and Gordon is framed, Hoffman is already under John's influence. But Hoffman only went under John's influence because John caught him masquerading as Jigsaw when he killed Seth Baxter. Meaning that John had to have already tested some victims for Hoffman to copy. So despite Kerry and Tap talking in Saw when they find the Razor Box Trap, as if Paul was the first victim of Jigsaw, this isn't actually the police first encounter with Jigsaw, as of the new canon created by Saw 5. Since the games in the Tuck Barn were never found by the police, that implies there were a decent number of games in between the Tuck Barn games in Jigsaw and the death of Seth Baxter that we haven't seen, that Hoffman, Tap, and Singh work the cases for. But in the FBI's boxes of files of probable jigsaw victims that we see in Saw 5, it goes straight from Cecil Fletcher to Mark and Seth, 
with no indication of any victims between them known to the FBI. So the police knew about these hypothetical extra murders, but the FBI didn't. Ah! God, I hate Saw 5 so much. Mark Hoffman, why do you ruin everything, you greasy-lipped bastard? <sighs> Fortunately, this story doesn't really care about that. And the original Saw wasn't made with the weapons-grade headassery that was the Saw 5 continuity rewrite, so that's not actually relevant to the exact content of this video. I just wanted to bring it up for the sakes of completeness and to make sure nobody in the comments asking about Hoffman's involvement, because I'm frankly just tired of that man, and the plot holes caused by him being squeezed into Saw Cannon like a turd that just won't flush. Anyway, back on topic. It's important to remember that Tap and Sing are partners and play off each other as partners should, because it defines Tap's character both in the original movie and in the tome story that it inspired. Tap is the senior cop, 20 or more years older than Sing and a veteran of the force, and while Sing isn't a total rookie, clearly having solved his fair share of cases, he's still much more emotional than Tap when it comes to the grittier parts of the job. They are good cops, but only truly excel when they work together to back each other up, and when they're left on their own, their individual flaws often cause them to get unstuck. Tap is experienced, calculating, and extremely dedicated to bringing justice and safety to the people around him. But that comes at the cost of any amount of perspective. His work-life balance is worse than mine, and he's often so dedicated to closing his cases and seeing the bad guy put behind bars, he loses track of everything and everyone else around him, leaving him prone to acts of self-destruction or careless harm to others. If Tap is the calculating and observant head of the pair, Singh is the heart. On the face of it, he's a much more reasonable person than Tap. His youth means he's yet to be jaded like his senior. He's far more likely to do police work by the book, too. And he seems to have a good social life and balances it with his work in a healthy way. That being said, his relative inexperience as a homicide detective means he's prone to missing details the old master picks up on. Like the K2K graffiti in the background of Amanda's tape. And in the heat of the moment, he's liable to make hasty decisions, something that's very dangerous to do in his line of work. When Tap's lead takes the pair to the Dishy's Mannequin Factory on 213 Stygian Street, the part of the night between the two of them starts to break down. When Jigsaw is coming up the elevator, Sing is content to try and make an arrest, but Tap overrules him and suggests they hide instead, presumably to wait for Jigsaw to further implicate either himself or potentially an accomplice. Making the conviction stick matters to Tap, so he wants to ensure there's no possible technicality the killer could use to earn plausible deniability. But what nobody could have foreseen was Jigsaw keeping a live victim in his workshop ready for a test. And this is when the differences between Tap and Singh start to become a problem rather than an asset. When confronted by the cops, John activates Ridenauer's trap and offers the duo an ultimatum. They could arrest him, but leave Jeff Ridenauer to die in the trap, or they could save Ridenauer's life, but in doing so, buy Jigsaw the time to escape. This is where the fracture happens in their partnership. Tap prioritises arresting Jigsaw over saving Ridenauer, while Sing tries to deal with Jigsaw's trap and save Ridenauer's life. But by splitting their focus, John seizes an opportunity to escape by cutting Tap's throat with a hidden blade and makes a run for it. This can only be seen as the failure of Tap and Singh's partnership. Because their attention is divided, they don't have each other's backs, and Tap's injury and Jigsaw's escape are the consequences. If they'd have both focused on restraining John, Ridenauer would have been dead but Jigsaw apprehended. And if they'd both focused on freeing Ridenauer quickly, John might have escaped but at least no one would be hurt. With his senior out of action and John on the run, Singh decides to take matters into his own hands and pursue Jigsaw on his own, but in his inexperience he runs through an unsecured doorway and meets his end to a trap John had placed. A rack of shotguns over the door that, when Singh unwittingly triggers the tripwire, turns the young man's head into chunky salsa, if it was made out of human instead of out of tomatoes. Are you trying to get yourself killed? You know never to go through an unsecured door, ever. Tap staggers down the stairs, clutching his slashed throat to find his partner dead and Jigsaw nowhere to be found. 
and the sight of Singh's body changes everything. With his partner dead, Jigsaw in the wind, and his job in the police force lost to raiding the mannequin factory without a warrant, Tap fell deep into obsession. His life became defined by the identification and capture of Jigsaw, and the next we see of him in the movie is six months after his discharge, working out of a dingy little apartment as he stalks Dr. Lawrence Gordon, his prime suspect in the Jigsaw murders. Desecration of the Heart takes place during that six month time gap, at least it seems to, while Tap is unemployed and pursuing the Jigsaw leads on his own. And right away there's one great big stinking problem that already leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Since when was Tap married? He never mentions his wife or wears a wedding ring in the movie, and when Tap's wearing himself out watching Amanda's tape over and over again, Singh even lampshades how incredibly single Tap is as a result of his obsession with his work. For this to be disrespectful, maybe you should find yourself a girlfriend. <laughs> Interestingly, this isn't the first time in alternate canons for Saw that Tap has been married. In the Saw 3 Flesh and Blood game, it was revealed that Tap, who was the player character for the first game, was divorced from his wife Kara, and was an absent father to a son Michael, who would be the subject of his own jigsaw test as the main protagonist of the second game. Admittedly, this one makes a hell of a lot more sense because Michael's an adult, and it's made clear that Kara split from David because of his obsession with Jigsaw rather than trying to shove a wife midway through the six month time skip. And the games aren't canon anyway. Save their lives and find the story of your father's death. Discovering the truth will set you free. Fuck you, you fucking psycho! You killed my dad! This is not fucking canon! But I'm willing to forgive at least some amount of this, because if Tap did have a wife, how he treats her in this story is completely consistent with his character in Saw. While he does love her and cares about her well-being, he seems distant from her, always second to his work. The story opens with him preparing for a well-earned vacation alongside his wife, who I'm just going to call Kara for the rest of the video to offer some small measure of respect to the second Saw game. While Tap being a distant husband to a wife who wants them both to be able to relax on vacation is a sin against the actual canon status of the character, it serves his actual character and personality well. Because if he did have a wife, that's exactly the kind of husband he would be. And the theme of leaving your loved ones behind is a core part of the story. Desecration of the Heart is told in two concurrent parts. Detective Tap meeting with Mr. and Mrs. Serenko, the grieving parents of Jigsaw's latest victim, intercut with flashbacks to Tap's pursuit of Jigsaw through an abandoned factory and encounter with that victim. I've got to say, as someone intimately familiar with the flashback heavy editing style typical of the Saw movies, I really do appreciate this way of storytelling. It feels super authentic to the movies. What it also manages to do is fix the show don't tell problem that behaviour has a really nasty habit of doing when it comes to their stories. Instead of Tap's internal monologue droning on about how sad he feels for five chapters, we actually get to see what he says and does in the present and relate it directly back to the actions he took in the past. One thing I did appreciate was Tap's talk with the Serenko parents and that feeling of not really knowing how to talk about death, especially around the dead person's loved ones. Anyone who's ever spoken to a bereaved person will be able to relate to how incredibly awkward it feels and how hard it is to know what to talk about or how to say it. Tap stands and waits, tries to ignore the discomfort, reminds himself that what they're going through is far worse. He's a spectator, torn between offering condolences and leaving them to their grief. Either choice lacks sincerity. All these years and he still doesn't know what to do. No one ever does. This... This is some real shit. When you're around somebody who's lost someone close to them, it can be hard to remember that no matter what you're feeling, they're feeling worse and that can breed serious guilt. Because it can feel like you're being selfish by thinking about what you're feeling instead of being there for them. That is what Tap feels here. That sense of Guilt both for being there and taking up space and getting in the way of the grieving family. And the guilt of wanting to lead them on their own. No matter what you do, it never feels right. 
and I appreciate how directly the story approaches it. But as the flashbacks to Jigsaw's abandoned factory show us, Tap's guilt is more than just that of a spectator watching a family grieve for their dead son. As the story goes on, we learn that Tap isn't just sad because Jigsaw took another victim and his family is grieving, but instead because his role in Shane's death was rather more personal. And while he obviously didn't kill Shane or want him to die, some of responsibility for Shane's death rests on his shoulders. Back when Tap investigated the factory, he found Jigsaw prepared and waiting for him, and Shane strapped into a trap. Which, judging by the cinematic, looks like a mix between Troy's classroom trap from the opening of Saw 3 and Cecil's knife chair trap from the flashback in Saw 5. Shane's chained to a wall by hooks embedded in his arms and back, and is slowly pulled into a jackhammer that will gouge his chest and stomach if he can't free himself. He first has to get the key from the ring over his head, and then pull the meat hooks out of his body so the machine doesn't pull him in. When Tap arrives, it's already almost too late, and as he arrives in Shane's room, he sees Jigsaw making a run for it. This is where Detective Tap has to make his choice. Does he allow his obsession to overcome his morality and pursue Jigsaw, or does he save Shane and allow Jigsaw to escape? It's a very similar choice to the one he made in the Mannequin Factory, when he and Singh caught Jigsaw red-handed. Is Jigsaw being behind bars worth the blood of an innocent man on his hands? And just like at the Mannequin Factory, Tap lets his obsession with catching Jigsaw consume him, and because he falters he has to watch helpless, as Shane dies in the trap. By leaving Shane behind, John was testing Tap, just like he tested them at the factory. And once again, Tap's obsession made him fail the test, and he has to live with the consequences of that. Just like how he had to live without Sing after the events of the Mannequin Factory. This revelation makes it clearer why Tap feels so guilty around Mr. and Mrs. Serenko. In effect, his inaction killed their son, and he can't bring himself to tell them the truth. It's a self-feeding cycle. His mounting guilt adds to his obsession with catching Jigsaw to atone for his own sins, and have a chance of getting his life back, causing his obsession to become more all-consuming, and causing more people to be hurt in the process. Although there is one problem with this. Despite Shane's death mirroring the death of Stephen Singh so closely both in terms of the method of death and its impact on Tap's psyche, Tap never seems to comment on that. The death of Singh shattered his world completely and caused his life to change its course forever. You think he'd, you know, remember it, right? Unless, um... Wait, hang on. No, it... It all makes sense. Okay, so remember what I was talking about earlier? That big plot hole in Saw 5 with the missing murders between the Tuck Barn killings in Jigsaw and Seth Baxter's execution by Hoffman in the start of Saw 5 and the Pendulum Trap? Well, I got a theory. Tap's tome doesn't take place after Singh's death during that six month time skip in the middle of Saw, but I think Shane's death is one of those missing Jigsaw murders that takes place long before the events of Saw. Alright? You might be wondering about how I think that, but let me explain. Despite the obvious parallels between Singh's death and Shane's, Tap never seems to mention Singh or his death in his internal monologue, suggesting that Tap just didn't remember, or the far more likely option, he hasn't met Singh yet. Another detail, Tap in this story is married, which at first glance doesn't make sense because Singh points out how Tap's terrible work-life balance has left him single. However, Tap was married for a while in the continuity of the Saw games, but his wife left him before the events of Saw over his mounting obsession. These details don't fit together if the tome was set after Singh's death and Tap rejected from the Force, but before, it all makes sense. By setting this story before the events of Saw, the tome suggests Tap is married before working on the Jigsaw case, something which Singh's dialogue in the movie never contradicts. If anything, the distance Tap has from his wife as he goes chasing Jigsaw deeds explains why she would divorce him in the first place. Instead of taking a vacation with his wife, Tap decides to chase up Jigsaw leads on his own and runs into Shane's game at the abandoned factory. 
His pursuit of Jigsaw meant that Shane died in the jackhammer trap and that guilt followed him ever since. Shane's death and the death of the other woman in the Iran factory prior, both taking place before Tat's partnership with Singh, closes the plot hole from Saw 5. Because these are Jigsaw's first known murders, and the template Hoffman would use to build the trap for Seth Baxter. We've just witnessed the missing murders! And if this is true, if Shane was one of Jigsaw's first ever victims that Tat found before partnering with Singh, it makes a lot of the emotional beats in Tap's life that we see in Saw hit so much harder. For starters, John rigging up Ridenour's trap in his workshop takes a whole new and more disturbing subtext if he's crossed paths with Tap before. If John knows Tap left Shane to die in their last encounter, setting up the same situation again with Ridenour is his way of seeing if Tap has changed or rehabilitated since then and learned to value human life over catching Jigsaw. Ridenour goes from just being a helpless victim in the right place at the right time to be used by John to a deliberately chosen implement in John's own prepared game for Tap, a test which Tap fails and for which he suffers the loss of his partner as a consequence. Additionally, Singh's death to the shotgun rack in the mannequin factory becomes a whole lot more tragic if you consider this might not be the only life Tap sacrificed in his pursuit of Jigsaw. It makes Tap's total emotional breakdown over the course of Saw much more meaningful, because he's not only driven off the slippery slope to avenge Singh, but also to honour Shane's memory and the departure of Kara to make sure everything he lost was not in vain. And, last but not least, the notion of Tap's wife leaving him, which the story implies she will, and the death of Singh and Shane on his conscience adds extra weight to his choice to save Allison and Diana Gordon from Zepp. Tap by this point is a broken man, one who lost his wife and his partner to Jigsaw and whose obsession has stained his own hands with innocent blood. Choosing to stick his neck out for Dr Gordon's family is his redemption for everything he's done, for all his work has cost those around him. And it takes on a bittersweet turn when you learn in the director's commentary for Saw 7 that Allison wound up leaving Lawrence and taking Diana from him after his escape from the bathroom in Saw because it affirms that those who fall under Jigsaw's influence are never the same again, and wind up hurting or alienating those around them even if they survive. Allison and Diana left Lawrence because they couldn't deal with how the bathroom fractured his mental state, just like how Tap's wife is implied to have left him because his obsession with catching Jigsaw eclipsed everything else in both of their lives. Tap's life is a perfect mirror to the man he thought was Jigsaw, how fucking neat is that? With this realisation, a story that seemed to at first be full of canonical misfires and snarls is in reality anything but that. The twisted canon of Saw is incredibly hard to navigate, as retcons, rewrites and hidden characters pulling the strings stack up on top of each other like a weird lasagna. But whether they have planned on it or not, behaviour have run with it, and made a story that didn't just stand up alongside that complex canon, but actually added to it in a meaningful and thought-provoking way. And I think I've just solved a 14-year-old plot hole in a billion-dollar, nine-movie giant of a horror cinema using a Dead by Daylight story. God, I love my job. With this in mind, the only issues that I have with Desecration of the Heart, the canonical anachronisms, are no longer issues, because shifting the story to long before the events of Saw actually clears up some of the franchise's existing plot holes or contrivances, and does so while telling a faithful and emotional story about a character who always had more potential than was given to him by Saw. Like, no exaggeration here, I think this might be my favourite survivor story of all time. And I'll admit, some degree of that is probably down to my rampant bias in favour of all things Saw related, but even independently of the character and franchise it's attached to, there's so much to love about Desecration of the Heart. Everything from the writing style to the surprisingly intimate exploration of Tat's emotional reaction just works exceptionally well. I absolutely adore it. If you like Saw, read Desecration of the Heart. If you never watched Saw, watch Saw and then read Desecration of the Heart. If you don't like Saw, read Desecration of the Heart anyway, because it's just that good. It is the perfect template for future licensed tomes to cover. 
It fills in natural gaps caused by serialized storytelling that came about over several years and expanded on a fan favorite character in ways that felt natural and authentic to the parent series. Which is more positive than I can say about Amanda's story, but we'll get to that another time. For now, all I can say is, well done, behavior, encore, and I can't wait to see what lore there is to come. Wait, hang on. What's this? After all this time, my patience is finally rewarded with getting something that isn't just random nerfs and bugs that only get fixed. Our times come, it's finally happening! <laughs> yes! Oh, and, uh, and, and David again. Eh, I like this David more anyway. So, that's everything I have to say about Detective David Tapp. And, I'm sorry this took a little while, I have been away for about a week, I've been literally travelling cross country. But, don't worry, we are 100% back to business. And it couldn't come at a finer time, because... The Ring chapter has already been revealed on PTB, and it's incredibly exciting. So expect separate back-to-back -back videos about Sadako Yamamura and Yoichi Asakawa coming in the next week or two. To make sure you don't miss it, be sure to like and subscribe with the notification bell to make sure you don't miss an update. And in the description you can find links to my Discord, my Twitch, my Twitter, and my Ko-fi and Patreon links if you feel like this content deserves your money. And before I go, a big thanks to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. If you want to download projects for yourself and upgrade your browsing experience, you can find the link in the description. That's all from me for now, and until then, well, stay safe. Ta-ta for now.